Thanks so much. Uh, you know, I'm really excited for this conversation. I think there's so much to get to. Um, I'm curious because we're all kind of in positions I don't think we expected to be finding ourselves in. Let's say you had a minute to talk to your younger self and explain the problems in tech and how we got there. How would you describe what the issues are with the tech industry? And assuming you had a few seconds left over, what advice would you give your younger self? Well, I'll jump in and I'll just say I would probably explain to my younger self that this is all about power. Um, this is all about um, the concentration of wealth and power by a few that can make decisions that they're simply not qualified to make. And this is happens when a society doesn't have rules. And the advice that I would sort of give to my younger self is that we um, um, need to think about tech inside of the ways in which we think about our advocacy and civil rights work. Yes, there are nuances and contexts that relate to technology, but that to be clear, just like the television, um, just like the telephone were tools that we could use to reach more people, amplify our actions, move our demands, it doesn't mean that those institutions should operate without rules. Meredith, is it just about power? It's all just about power, and I'm really vibing on Rashad's answer here. I think I would I would look at young Meredith, and I would say, you know, don't be so tech dazzled when they talk about innovation, when they talk about entrepreneurship, when you you know sit down and take those really boring programming classes. Those are not actually going to bring you as much closer to understanding the core of technology and the technology industry in late capitalism as looking around and understanding the political economy and the incentives that are driving these firms. So one of the things we talk about a lot is, you know, it's really important to have the right people in the room. It's important that the community be represented. But how much is the people in the room influencing the issues of today versus other systemic problems beyond just the workforce composition? You know, we say this a lot at Color of Change is that we can't mistake presence for power. Visibility and awareness and being at the table doesn't substitute the ability to shape or change the rules, the written rules and the unwritten rules. And so, yes, it would be changed. Things would absolutely change in terms of um, if the room looked different. But, um, you know, we're not looking, as my good friend Dorian Warren of Community Change says, we're not looking for rainbow oligarchy. And so if we um, end up with diversity for diversity's sake that doesn't actually change the nuances, the structures, the contours, and in particular the rules, then what we just do is we like paint diversity over a problematic structure and black and brown people can be just as complicit in, in these structures um, if we don't actually have rules that um, allow for um, the type of accountability um, that, that's necessary. Yeah, what, what Rashad said. I mean, I've, I have, I've been in those rooms, right? Those aren't my rooms. Um, you know, I'm playing by their rules. And oftentimes, you know, at least in my experience, um, it was very clear that, you know, the few of us who were women and, you know, the even fewer people who were Black women or women of color in those rooms, you know, often had the least power and were doing the most work you know, kind of diver diversity theater work where we were, you know, we were there so they could say we're there. So I think this may be the toughest question I could think of when I was trying to think up questions. What would a functional, healthy tech sector look like? What would it need to have? How would it operate? And what do we need to change to get there? Most of these questions aren't questions of technology, right? We're talking about criminal justice. We're talking about questions of housing. We're talking about questions of education. We're talking about, you know, questions of, of medicine and medical racism and discrimination. These are, these are all their own extraordinarily complex domains with their own histories, with their own sets of you know, expertise. And what we have seen is we've seen you know, technologies and technological solutionism be threaded through these domains in ways that are amplifying a lot of the, the pathologies of the tech industry. Um, but I think, you know, first and foremost, we would have to recognize that, you know, understanding how to program or understanding how to train a neural net does not give you insight or purchase on most of these questions. In fact, you may be, you know, less well prepared because the type of education you get is extraordinarily narrow. When I think about, uh, you know, healthy industries, industries that provide us our food, right, there's an FDA that actually oversights and, and evaluates and has accountability and has 
um, certifications, and all of the things that industries that um, are still allowed to thrive, people still make money, uh, people still grow, but there's accountability. And these are not perfect industries. But what I'm saying is, is that in, if until we actually have systems and structures that, um, that force those who go into these industries to know that they just can't move fast and break things because they will break people and have to not be accountable for any of it, that um, things won't flourish that we also have to think as a society, what are utilities and what are pu and public goods and what are not? And we have to be sort of conscious of those things. What are the sort of you know, tools that everyone needs and in our society and that we should be providing to everyone? Um, you know, I think that you know, when, I, when I end up in the rooms at, you know, whether it's at the highest levels at Twitter or Facebook, it's like you're sitting across the table from someone that you're presenting all these problems to, and they're making a decision about whether or not they believe you or whether or not they're gonna do something about it, or whether or not it animates their attention. And they get to like sit back and play God without any accountability, without any consequences. When something really bad happens on their platform, what I get is doe eyes. I really care, Rashad. You know, like this, this, you know, when, when we heard the news, it really, it really hit me here. Um, and I know that like that absolutely means nothing. When a corporation tells me that they feel something, um, it only matters if they feel it in their wallet. And to the extent that like in let, until we get new rules, we won't actually have a healthy system. And from there, a whole lot of other things can flow. Things can be built, but at the heart of it, they will be built with a vision of accountability for how they actually um, affect and impact people. Um, we haven't really talked about AI, um, and that's, I know, your specialty, Meredith. Why is it so important that we get things right? I think, you know, um, we talk about, you know, AI and computers as if they're these objective things, or in the popular culture, they sometimes get talked about that way. The way I look at it, and I'm curious if you see it the same, is, you know, the, the real potential is to automate bias. And how important is it to build fairness and transparency and accountability into these AI systems? And what's the risk if we don't? Yeah, I, I want to draw on what Rashad said and sort of, you know, kind of focus on a, a, a quote by um, the inimitable Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore, where she puts it really clearly, uh, capitalism requires inequality, racism enshrines it, right? And this gets back to, there are winners from racism. There are winners from misogyny. These systems are not accidents. So I think we need to look at these systems. Of course, they are going to, they are going to replicate, they are going to amplify, they are going to reflect the cultures and the incentives from which they came. This shouldn't surprise us. We look at AI and this myth of objectivity. Um, you know, I, I think we need to we need to recognize that that is a construction that has happened over the past decade or so. That is a story that's being told by tech companies about the capabilities of their vastly concentrated power, their vastly concentrated computational resources, their vastly con concentrated data resources, and their monopolistic hold on the combination of resources that are required to make what are sort of you know, data-centric computational technologies that they then sell as AI, as machine learning, as capable of all sorts of magical feats, which allows them to honor their capitalist incentives, which is to grow forever exponentially without end and enter as many markets as possible. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's urgent that we address that. But again, as Rashad said, and as, as you know, many of us have been saying, it's urgent that we address that as an issue of power and as an issue of inequality and not as an issue of sort of technical fitness fixes for fairness or bias around the edges of these technologies that we take as a given. Well, I'd love to keep this conversation going. Two fascinating people doing very important work. Thank you so much for taking part in the conversation and thanks for watching. Thank you. Thanks.